Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Stephanie Way, and I'm the head of marketing and a co-founder of Sportsbox AI. Our topic tonight for the webinar is the body in the middle, the link between the ground and outcome. Um, our speakers will be Sportsbox's chief science officer, Dr. Phil Cheatham, as well as, as well as one of Canada's leading instructors, Scott Cox. I would say that Scott is not only a leading instructor in Canada, but in all of the world. Um, you guys are probably familiar with him. So what do we mean by the body in the middle? Well, with Sportsbox's app, you can now use it anywhere to capture accurate 3D data with biomechanical measurements. That means you can do it on the driving range, on the golf course, in the swing studio, wherever you would like. Um, previously, 3D motion capture systems were a lot less flexible and cumbersome. You have to attach wires, sensors, um, which none of those none of those things are ideal for several reasons. Obviously, when you have all those attachments on your body, you might swing differently. Um, you also can't take them anywhere. They're restricted to a studio and they're also very expensive. But now the Sportsbox's app, you can literally do it anywhere. Um, it's truly 3D on the go and we've changed the game. So Phil will kick things off with his talk on biomechanics and the background of measurement technology and the technology that has allowed us to measure ground forces as well as club and ball flight outcome. And he'll talk about some of the old tech that was used to capture body data and how Sportsbox has really changed the game with our 3D on the go. And then Scott will talk about the practical application of using Sportsbox. And he did some case studies with his players and measured how their bodies changed, whether they were hitting a draw or a fade and from a flat lie or downhill lie. So without further ado, I will let Phil kick things off. Well, the intro has already been given by Stephanie, but yeah, we're going to talk about the link between the ground forces and the outcome, which is the, the flight of the ball. Um, at the ground level, you've got force places to force plates, excuse me, to measure the reaction forces of your body moving on the ground. And I'll talk about that. And then of course, at the other end, we've got the outcome, which is the club uh, delivery and the ball flight. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But the body motion in between um, has been hard to measure um, and it's been very expensive to measure. And so we're going to talk about how Sportsbox has changed that for the good. And now we can measure body motion just as easily as we can measure uh, forces in the ground and uh, the ball flight. But first, as I always tend to do, I would like to uh, jump back to a couple of definitions, which will ground us for um, some of the discussions to come. Okay, so biomechanics. Biomechanics now is what Sportsbox is uh, able to do. We're using the science of biomechanics to analyze the golfer's motion during the swing. And so that's what, that's what they brought me along for, uh, and that's what we do. So biomechanics is the study of human motion using the principles of math, geometry, physics, engineering, and of course, anatomy. Um, and when we use biomechanics in sport, we are using it as a rationale to give us reasoning as to why we teach specific techniques. Um, we wanna make sure that the techniques we teach are grounded in science. So the two goals of biomechanics are one, we wanna help improve performance, perhaps more rapidly than if we didn't use biomechanics. And of course, we wanna walk that fine line between performance and injury. We wanna try and reduce injury at the same time. Um, another thing that the biomechanics can do, of course, uh, and we're not going to talk about it today, but it can also help with equipment design. Now within, I'm sorry, if you hear a little creaky noise, that's my chair. It's tending to make a little bit of a creaky noise, but just ignore that. So anyway, two of the divisions of uh, biomechanics are kinematics and kinetics. Now kinetics is the study of forces and the interaction of those forces on the body and how they create motion. And that includes both internal forces being inside the body and external forces being forces outside of the body and forces of the body on the world around you. Um, I like to think about that as the feel of the motion because 
the forces, of course, uh, make you feel um, the pressure and the force being uh, acted upon you. Now, kinematics is the result of the forces. It's the motion that's created on the body. So it's what the motion looks like. And it's the motion without concern to the forces or the torques that produce the motion. So you've got kinematics and kinetics. Obviously, force platforms do kinetics. And sports box and the body motion is kinematics, as is the flight of the ball. That's also kinematics. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in just a, in, in fact in the next slide. So let's talk about the measurement tech that we use to give us the biomechanics of the swing. The measurement tech allow us to measure kinematics and kinet, uh, kinetics of the body and the club, and of course the flight uh, outcome of the ball. So the three of them, we've got force plates, motion capture systems, and launch monitors, all tools now that we can use to measure the swing. Force plates, of course, uh, measure the kinetics because kinetics is forces and force plates measure forces and torques under your feet and how you apply those forces to the ground and how the ground re reacts back to those forces. I'll talk a little bit uh, more detail in just a, a minute or so. Motion capture systems, they're the piece in the middle, they're measuring the body motion um, and that's kinematics. And the old technology, oh, I'm sorry, I, I should have talked about the different types of force platforms that you can purchase. You've got force platforms from Swing Catalyst, GASP, Smart to Move. Now, these are, some of these are not the original force plates themselves. They've acquired the hardware from companies like AMTI and Burtec and Kistler. Those are the manufacturers of the original force platforms and they've put their labels on them and they've added their software to them. All of those platforms are very, very good quality, very expensive scientific uh, research-based type plates. Uh, okay, back to the motion capture systems. Um, so some of the old tech, and I'm calling it old tech because as we move into the future, I think we're not gonna be able to, or not gonna need to use sensors and markers and put things on the golfer. Having worked for the last 11 years, 12 years for the US Olympic Committee at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado, I'm sorry, in uh, Chula Vista, California, I learned very quickly that the athletes don't like to have things put on them. They just wanna go about their training. They just wanna get their job done. And if you're gonna measure them, then you've gotta do it from afar and try and stay away from them. So if you're gonna get them in and you're gonna use gears or AMM or Qualysis or Vicon, and you're gonna put markers on it, you can't do it in a training session every day. You can only do it as an analysis or an assessment, maybe once a month, once a quarter, something like that. So fortunately with Sportsbox now, you can do it all the time. You can do it on the course, you can do it on the driving range, because just like, in, in fact, it's even better than force platforms because you can take it onto the range. You can take it onto the course. No markers, no sensors, just one camera. So some examples of the tech I mentioned is gears, AMM, Qualysis, Vicon, and then you've got the markerless based systems and of course, uh, our system sports box. The launch monitors, uh, if you think about it, they measure kinematics as well. They only measure kinematics of the golf club itself and the ball in flight. And so they are the outcome of the swing. They're what you want to happen to the ball. Companies like Foresight, TrackMan, FlightScope. So let's delve a little bit deeper into uh, force plates and launch monitors and then talk about Sportsbox. So the important thing to remember is that muscles are what create the body motion. The ground does not create motion People sort of think, oh, the ground pushes, puts forces on me. It doesn't. You are the one that are putting the forces onto the ground. Gravity is pushing down on you and it's pushing you into the ground. And how you move, how you create your muscle motion creates the forces in the ground. You create internal forces and then they manifest on the interface between you and the world, which happens to be 
the ground. And that's why they call them ground reaction forces. The ground is reacting and resisting the body forces that you're putting upon the ground. And so force platforms measure these ground reaction forces. As you can see in the diagram, the forces are pushing up as these red and blue vectors actually show. But in fact, you are pushing down. So your force is exactly opposite to the ground reaction force. The force types, of course, are vertical forces, horizontal forces, and you can have those for horizontal forces left to right and forward back. They're called shear forces. And then you can have the rotational forces, which are called torques. And each foot can create forces. It can create the forces and it can create the torques. So the force platform is very, very useful to characterize swing styles. And you can have a look at what we call a tor quality kinetic sequence as distinct from the kinematic sequence, the kinetic sequence. Typically that's gonna be lateral forces first, rotational forces second, and then vertical forces come next. So you can think about it, slide, turn, and jump. Those are typically what's happening. And the force platform is really, really good at showing that. And we have a diagram here that can show you the horizontal forces, the rotational forces, and the vertical forces, just the same as what I talked about lateral being uh, the same as horizontal. And so you can use this to characterize um, a swinger and a, a golf swing and group them into different categories. However, a typical swing is a blend of these. It's just not just one or the other. It's gonna be a blend of slide, a blend of turn and a blend of jump. And so force platforms have come, become very popular because they're convenient. You simply stand and swing, but the problem is they tend to be expensive. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about launch monitors. Launch monitors measure the outcome, what you're trying to do and that's to optimize ball flight. Now, they also measure club. So you can get club kinematics and you can get ball flight kinematics. And the example I'm using here is from Foresight. So Foresight is gonna measure club head speed, impact point, angle of attack, club path, face angle, lie angle delivered, um, and impact loft and closure rate. So those are very important parameters for the club and they determine what happens to the ball because obviously the interface between you and the ball is the club head. So ball flight kinematics after impact, they happen after impact. Um, and of course, club kinematics occur at impact. So now the important parameters there that we can look at with launch monitors, are ball speed, launch angle, azimuth, which is really direction or, or um, horizontal angle, if you like, and then total spin and spin axis. Total spin, of course, is measured in revolutions per minute. Um, and it represents the outcome of the forces applied on the ground and the transmission of those forces through the body by the muscles across the joints. Um, and so, it, so it's directly the outcome um, of the body motion. Now, what about the body in the middle. Well, you've got the force platform at your feet and you've got your ball um, at the end of the club. And what you do with your body in between completely determines what's gonna to happen to that ball. And from my, uh, um, <laughs> from my research on the internet, which we all know the internet always gives us the correct answers, where we know now that there's over 600 muscles in the body and there's over 200 bones in the body. And from some simple calculations that I did, there's at least 35 degrees of freedom between the ground and the ball. And what I mean by degrees of freedom are actually directions or types of motion. For example, the, the ankle has two, it has um, inversion, eversion, and plantar flexion, dorsiflexion. And so you can go up the body joint by joint by joint, looking at how many degrees of freedom or how many motions each joint has by the time you get to the hands on the club. And quite frankly, 35 degrees of freedom is incredible 
to be able to control that and make the club do exactly what you want to do. So hundreds of mu muscles generating forces across the joints and moving our bones. And this complex coordinated motion must be measured in order to determine how we can improve that, how we can improve the technique. Remember, we talked about what biomechanics does. The whole idea of biomechanics of the body is to help you improve your technique. And so by measuring multiple parameters at different parts in the body allows us to determine what's happening in the swing, how to improve what's happening in the swing and how to optimize the swing. So Sportsbox 3D Golf actually allows us to measure the body with literally one camera, an iPhone, no markers, no sensors, an iPhone or an Android. So it's like 3D on the go in, in your back pocket. You can take it to the range and you can take it on the course. And uh, Scott's gonna talk about some of the things that he did. Um, I'm sure it was on the driving range initially, but it could easily be done. Oh, well, actually probably not. I'm, I'm misspeaking there because he actually had to find some downhill lies. So there's a good example of him taking it out on the course. And, and I'm excited to hear his results on what the different kinematics are between those types of uh, situations. Okay, so I talked about the kinematics and I talked about all the different degrees of freedom. So every time there's a different degree of freedom across a joint, there's something we can measure. Like, you know, with the, with the hip, um, if it's internal, external rotation, if it's flexion, extension, we can measure those and we can give you those parameters directly by using Sportsbox. So some of the parameters we're measuring, at least in the current incarnation of the software, we're measuring chest turn, pelvis turn, and X factor. So those are the turn parameters. We're measuring chest, um, I'm sorry, chest side bend and pelvis side bend. Obviously, if you think about the name of the term, it means what your, how is your chest bending sideways and how is your pelvis bending sideways? Some people get a little confused with those. Your chest and your pelvis can move independently and they can turn independently as well. So that's how we can measure chest and pelvis separately. And that's quite a chore to do that with a markerless motion capture system. That's quite an achievement. Uh, and we're doing a really good job um, of measuring those. And by the way, um, a question that Scott just asked me earlier today was why do the numbers for X factor sometimes not add up to chest turn minus pelvis turn. Uh, isn't that the definition of X factor? Well, it would be if you were measuring with a two dimensional system, but in three dimensions, once you've got some side bend going on and once you've got some turn going on, plus the uh, X factor, sorry, it's turn, side bend and forward bend going on, all of those put together don't allow a simple addition of chest turn and pelvis turn values to get X factor. So once you're in 3D, they don't just add up. So it's not a fact of the being an error, it's a fact of the way the biomechanics works in three dimensions. So we've got chest bend, we've got flexion, as I mentioned earlier, we talk about flexion, we've got knee flexion, we've got elbow flexion, and then we've got the whole class of sway and lift. So the turns, the side bends and the bends and the flexions they're all measured in degrees because they're angles. Now we get over to the other side of the page there and you see sways and they're measured in inches or centimeters. And you've got pelvis sway, which is side to side motion of the pelvis, chest sway, side to side motion of the chest. And of course you can do it with the knee, the, the trail knee and the lead knee. And now we've even added the sway and lift of the, of the mid hands. So where they are on the club, and that's a new parameter that's very exciting to, to look at because we can get the trajectory of how your hands are moving throughout the entire swing. If you're coming over the top, if you're going inside out, we can show those different hand paths that are manifested from the way that the body is moving. And finally on the list here, we've got uh, lift. I mentioned sway and lift together. We've got shaft angle, and that's the angle of the club shaft from a freight face on view. So that's very interesting at address. And certainly at impact, you know, are they a handle dragger? Are they a scooper? And those are the sorts of things that we can measure from shaft face on angle. 
So if any of you guys know me and know my history, you'll know that I was one of the guys that defined uh, originally the kinematic sequence. And so I'm very excited that coming up in the near future, we're gonna be able to measure the kinematic sequence as well. So the kinematic sequence inc includes pelvis turn speed, chest turn speed in degrees per second, and then lead arm swing speed and club shaft swing speed. Those four curves are what you've seen through TPI and AMM, and those make up the standard kinematic sequence, and those are measured in degrees per second. But also, we'll be able to, as I talked about, we, we can do mid-hands, and if we can get the position of the mid-hands, then we can get mid-hand speed. And strangely enough, maybe not so strangely, but interestingly enough, there is a linear kinematic sequence going on as well. So you can have the mid-hand speed, which does not max out at impact. It peaks out before impact and decelerates, kind of like what the kinematic sequence curves do. So we're gonna talk more in the future about linear kinematic sequence as well. And hosel speed would be one, of, one part of that. And then the other two we've got on the screen here are wrist release angle. That's the angle, the two-dimensional two angle between the forearm and the shaft and how that is uh, either an early release like casting or a, down, uh, a downswing loading or um, different types of release angles. We'll be able to look at those. And finally, timing and tempo. So typically you've heard that the backswing to the downswing ratio should be around three to one. From the AMM database, we found that it's about for, for the tour pros we measured, it's about 3.2 to one. So yeah, we are de definitely in that range of three to one. So if a golfer is taking, has a ratio of about four to one, then you know that they're taking a very, very slow backswing. And honestly, using the uh, X-factor stretch and the stretch shorten cycle of muscle, it's good to keep that ratio uh, about three to one so that you're not making it too slow or even too fast. Finally, before I hand it over to Scott, uh, one of the cool things that we're learning from measuring all the swings and creating our databases, um, we're able to come up with what we call tracker truths. And from our pro databases, we can see what all tour pros do or what 95% of the tour pros, pros do. And Sportsbox can measure and display these kinematic trackers easily. So a couple of examples that I've got here are 100% of our male tour pros begin swaying towards or sliding towards the target before the top of backswing. So by the top of backswing, which is defined by when the club turns around, they're already moving towards the target. And that happens before they start to turn. Another track of truth is at impact, the chest or the upper body is moving away from the target. And if you think about a driver, this is with a driver, if you think about a driver and how fast that's swinging, that driver's weighing in excess of 100 pounds or more um, around the impact point. So that's going to make the chest move backwards and it's going to move the chest, make the chest move away from the target. So that's typ typical biomechanics, that's typical mechanics. But these are cool things that we can learn directly from measuring the swing. Uh, a couple of 95 percenters, uh, the pelvis is more open at impact than the chest. Um, so you still have effectively still have about a 10 degree X, X factor at impact between the pelvis and the chest. Um, and the pelvis turn is larger than the chest turn at impact. So the pelvis is turned more towards the target than the chest is. Again, a lot of these things you would intuitively think uh, are typical and make sense. But the cool thing is we can verify these by measuring them and comparing data of our tour pros. So that's it for me. Um, Scott is gonna talk about some practical applications and uh, we're gonna look at draw versus fade and flat lies versus downhill lie. So uh, I'll close off my sharing and I'll pass it over to you, Scott. All right, thanks, Doc. Let me uh, let me just put up my screen here. All 
Okay, you should have that one now. Can uh, can you still see me or can you just hear me? Just hear you. Just hear me? Okay. Uh, you might not be able to see me while I do this part, but I'll come back on afterwards. Uh, not that I'm going to do anything really groundbreaking, uh, you know, in the, in the picture there, but um, yeah, some really interesting things I'm excited about with Sportsbox. Some of the things that, um, you know, Philly just mentioned, obviously kinematic sequence. Um, well, I think it'll be fantastic looking at that from a, uh, from a 2d video um, looking at some of the, the stuff we talked about, some of the linear uh, sequence stuff about the uh, mid hands point and, and where the maximum speeds are. I think there's some, some interesting um, research to be done there in terms of release styles, in terms of ball flights, in terms of um, trajectory and height, I think is a big one uh, when we start to look at those uh, kind of pieces as well. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to some of those things. Uh, but tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the differences between, you know, a, a very small uh, a group of one here, but a couple of swings here of a couple of my best players on uh, flat and downhill lies and draws and fades. And some of the things that we can kind of capture uh, with the system. So when we look at case study number one, um, this is one of my uh, top ranked junior girls in the country, uh, Vanessa. And so I had her hit some balls in the range. We did a lesson the other day and, and we just went to the range where there's some downhill lies. And kind of captured these two swings uh, from from her, and you know, put that up on the sports box. So I'll, I'll kind of let this play a couple of times here, and um, we'll kind of go through some of the key points. But it was interesting to see some of the changes, whether they were, um, let's say, the player self organizing, whether it was on purpose or not. Uh, we didn't really get into player intent. It was more, hey, here are the adjustments that this player made to hit the seven iron off a downhill lie versus uh, a regular flat line. So a couple things here, um, when we look at a couple still frames, I tried to sync up the, the swings as best as I could uh, just to make some comparative uh, numbers here for the uh, presentation here. But what we saw was a massive turn. Uh, Vanessa is a very flexible young lady, you know, 100 degrees of uh, chest turn at the top versus uh, 39 degrees of pelvic turn, um, you know, and then when we compared that to the downhill lie uh, swing, you know, she cut out about eight degrees of, um, of chest turn and about four degrees uh, of pelvic turn. So roughly, you know, kind of half and half, if you will, from the original um, swing that we looked at. Where it got very interesting to me was a little bit of her chest sway and pelvic sway numbers um, changed quite a bit. You know, the chest at the top of her swing, I would define the swing on the left there as a, we'll call it a centered pivot. Um, when she did the downhill lie, there was a slight, you know, call it reverse pivot. Um, the pelvic sway was negative, the chest sway was positive, and we actually created a little bit of a, uh, a negative um, tilt there. You know, from there, when we get to P5 halfway down, um, a couple of little, little differences there as well. We start to see the regular swing you know, there's about a one uh, inch, 1.3 inch uh, differential between the chest sway number and the pelvic sway number on the regular swing. Vanessa normally likes to play uh, a little bit of a push draw, very straight ball striker, but uh, little draws most of the time versus again, the, the centered tilt, if you will, um, on, the, on the downhill line. So not only did she turn kind of in a reverse pivoted way, if you will, on the uh, top of the backswing, but kind of kept that relationship into the downswing. So a very centered movement uh, with that downhill lie. Um, at impact, what we see is uh, certainly a lot more forward sway on the regular swing, um, 7.5 inches of pelvic sway and 4.7 uh, inches of chest sway. So uh, quite a lot of lateral movement uh, in her swing. Uh, one of the things that over time we're gonna try and contain a little bit is to try and contain some of the, uh, the lateral there. But uh, when we see the downhill lie swing, we see a little bit less pelvic sway of about one inch less, and again, about one inch less chest sway. So the relationship between the two uh, is about three inches, but overall, um, we're stabilizing that movement in the downswing on the downhill lie, which I thought was uh, quite interesting. Um, I figured the upper body would probably stabilize, but I was surprised to see that the lower body uh, actually reduced the amount of sway as well. And you know, with a little bit of, of thought there, I think it makes sense that she's trying not to fall down the hill, basically. So she's 
uh, engaging the ground a little bit differently, holding that pelvis in check. And then lastly, we see kind of the same relationship a little bit at the end of the swing where the overall sway values are a little bit less. So um, that's the first picture there was just to kind of highlight the differences in the sway values. When we look at the uh, overhead values here, you know, that's the nice thing is being able to look, take one swing and look at it from, you know, a tremendous amount of views here to get a lot of uh, perspective on, on what's actually occurring. Um, again, we see some massive rotations here. Um, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get my hand slapped for calculating the X factor off of the numbers here, but uh, uh, thanks uh, doc for um, setting me straight on that one. But anyways, if we look at the chest rotation versus pelvic rotation, just create a, a differential there. We've got about 62 degrees on the uh, regular swing and about 58. So a little bit less rotated, a little bit less X factor, um, if you will, on the uh, downhill lie. You know, the interesting thing is a uh, little bit in transition, we see a little bit of a larger X factor. And from this perspective, we kind of get an idea that the, the swing is a little bit more inside. And that's um, kind of represented a little bit by the position of that left arm. Um, and this being a, a planar swing, in planar mechanics, we can somewhat define what's going to happen down at the ball by where that lead arm position is at P5 halfway down. Uh, in non-planar mechanics, it's a little different, um, but that's not the scope of today's uh, session here. Uh, but we do see a little bit less X factor again on that um, downhill live shot. Now, where it gets a little bit interesting is a little bit at impact here. We see that the chest um, on the downhill lie has actually caught up to the pelvis on the downhill line versus there's about a four degree differential in the, uh, the chest rotation, the pelvic rotation on the regular swing. So she has stayed on top of this, if you want to call it that, or she has covered it a little bit more with her chest rotation on the downhill lie shot, which may account for some of the um, increase in the angle of attack and steepness needed to be able to hit that shot effectively. Um, so we see a little bit difference in the hand path because of that. When we look at this swing a little bit from down the line, okay, this is kind of nice to be able to look at it here and kind of track the overall shape of the hand path. And the hand path on the left there, again, Vanessa tends to hit a little bit of a, a push draw. We see kind of the exits, if you will, post impact on the hand path being a little bit more, uh, let's say outside of the line than uh, over here on the right-hand side. Um, the exit of the hand path is a little bit more mirroring what she's doing um, earlier. So we're swinging slightly more left, if you will, on the uh, right-hand picture on the downhill lie, which is kind of supported by the chest rotations and the fact that we're a little bit more up on, on top of the golf ball, if you will, at impact. So we're kind of stacking the uh, upper and lower centers a little bit more on that downhill lie shot. Um, so a couple of things, you know, I wanted to kind of point out with this. And again, this was, um, you know, certainly not uh, research grade material with uh, one, one individual hitting the shot here and one swing hitting the shot. But I think what it highlights more than anything else is the ability to, to take some of this uh, on the course with your players um, on difficult shots and maybe be able to analyze it after the round a little bit and say, hey, you know, when you missed that shot in number six today, you had that downhill lie. I've got that swing. Let's take a look at it and see what you did. Uh, you know, we mishit it. We, we struck it poorly. Perhaps there's something there that we can, we can kind of look at. But in general, uh, you know, the player self-organizes and, and kind of restricted the lateral sway movements to contain the degrees of lateral freedom. So more than anything else in this downhill lie swing, um, Vanessa kind of just held herself really steady in the middle, you know, for lack of a better word. Didn't have as much lateral movement back and forth. Um, by doing this, she kind of limited her rotation and reduced the X factor a little bit throughout, which does have the effect of kind of steepening the attack angle and swinging slightly more left or inward, or, you know, for those coaches in the room, let's say covering the ball a little bit more. Um, interestingly, as I said, the player actually moved less forward with the sway amounts in the chest and pelvis on the downhill lie, possibly to retain their overall balance. Now, this was a moderate slope. I think it would be interesting if we took uh, maybe degrees there, 1%, uh, 2% grades or whatever, all the way up to maybe a, 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 a six or an eight degree, uh, or sorry, percent grade 
and see how the player kind of organizes themselves as the uh, downhill lie gets steeper. Because I think eventually at some point, we're not going to be able to um, hold back that uh, gravity, if you will. And we'll probably end up, you know, taking our trail foot and stepping over the left foot at some point, the lead foot. But on this particular one, uh, Vanessa was able to stabilize the movement, actually reduce the amount of overall sway in the chest and the pelvis uh, as she made that shot. Um, from a teaching standpoint, I think the practicality from this is usually on a downhill lie, I will tell players or any, really any difficult lie that challenges your balance, generally put the ball toward the middle of the stance. And I think that kind of is, is a good idea, especially as we see some of the, the, the truths, if you will, that come from measuring this is the player is probably going to restrict some of those lateral movements as well. So putting the ball toward the middle of the stance probably gives me the best opportunity to make a reasonably uh, solid strike. Um, so that was, that was quite interesting. I, I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to see. And, and uh, again, with just one swing, it's tough to make uh, a lot of uh, uh, conclusion out of this, but I think that uh, it definitely gets a good conversation going. Now, the second one we did was, uh, you know, I took one of my, my pro players here and basically without telling them how, because I wanted to see what they would naturally do, but I had them basically hit a draw and then a fade back to back. And I wanted to see what they did uh, biomechanically different um, to match that intent. So I gave them no instruction on how to do this. I gave them no uh, clue on how to, to swing more left or right. Um, they did it all themselves. So when we look at these two swings, um, there are some interesting things because they're almost identical in a lot of ways or very, very, very similar in a lot of ways, but they were able to change the hand path. Um, and this maybe brings me up really quick as a, as a quick aside. One of my pet peeves is when we watch uh, swing analysis videos of, of players on TV or um, on YouTube or whatever, and we are basically randomly taking two swings of a player and comparing them. And uh, obviously we have no idea what that player's intent was, you know, so you can't compare Tiger Woods 2000 with Tiger Woods 2020 and, and say, Hey, look at all these differences here between Tiger 2000 and Tiger 2020 um, and, and draw conclusions from it because we have no idea what Tiger's shot shape. Obviously Tiger gets a lot of different shots, et cetera. My point is, unless we know the intent of the player, we can't really analyze it. Because a draw swing has to be different than a fade swing or else it wouldn't produce a different result. So there has to be changes here at some level to obviously influence the face-to-path relationships. So anyway, so the interesting thing about watching this player do this was um, how similar the swings were in a lot of ways. And yet we we're able to you know, can, um, hit two different shots. So when we looked at it, there was basically one main thing that the player did to hit a fade versus a draw was simply they changed their tilts. They changed their sway amounts more than anything else. So on the draw swing on the left-hand side, what we saw was about a 2.3 inch differential between the chest sway um, near the top of the swing and the pelvic sway. So the pelvis is already moving kind of back to the middle. Uh, the chest was a little bit behind that creating about a 2.3 inch differential. So that early tilt, if you will, is setting up a little bit more of an inside path uh, later on. The difference was on the fade swing, they actually slid the pelvis a little bit more to the right on the fade swing and actually created less differential, only about one inch difference. But in this case, the pelvis was slightly on the negative side of the starting point versus the positive side. So the chest sway really uh, wasn't much difference, only 0.3 of a difference, but the, the pelvic sway was different. Um, there was also a little bit more lift, so a slightly higher hand path. If we look at the hand path, the mid hands point lift amount, uh, about two inches higher roughly um, with that value, as well as we see a little bit more height in the chest value. So I think the hand value is really more representative of what's happening at the chest level. Um, we see that the chest lift amount was 0.4 inches. The um, uh, fade one was 1.3 inches. Okay, so again, not a lot, but you start talking about these, these fractional differences, one inch here and a half inch there, and that's enough to shift the path here to hit draw versus fade. 
So now at P5, you know, we had sort of um, a little bit more tilt halfway down on the draw swing, 2.7 inches of tilt. Um, on camera, on reference, I always use, you know, I look at the kind of with position of the chin versus the position of the belt buckle and what that relationship is like. Generally, if the chin is about on a planar swing, about one inch behind the belt buckle at P5, the swing direction is going to be quite neutral. If it's about two inches or more at P5, it's going to be a little bit on the draw side. Um, usually fades are a little bit more on top of the, the belt buckle here. Um, in this case, it uh, doesn't quite represent those numbers, but we do see that the fade pattern, the um, upper and lower has a little bit less differential. Okay. So that alone is kind of how that player is, is bending this, this swing direction a little bit. By the time we get to impact, you know, there's about a 4.1 differential between the pelvis and the uh, chest way amounts at impact. Uh, with a seven iron, this was a seven iron shot. Uh, that's generally what I'm seeing is somewhere between three to five inches difference uh, with those two numbers for a lot of good players. Uh, depends a little bit, obviously, on the ball flight. Also depends on the torso length and obviously a few other um, anatomical features there. But less tilt, certainly in the fade swing. Um, and interestingly enough, by the end of the swing, we see that kind of carried through that there's less tilt in the finish, a little bit more of a rounded finish on the fade swing, a little bit more over the shoulder, if you will, on the draw swing. Again, so just kind of looking at some of the difference between sway and lift and, and so on between those two swings. When we look at the swings a little bit more from the top, again, we, we see some interesting things here. Um, Overall, the amounts were actually very eerily similar in terms of the rotation values. Okay, so the player rotation is almost identical, just a very slight different structure, like I said, in the, in the pelvis uh, primarily in terms of how much sway. So by allowing the sway in the pelvis to be a little bit more negative, we're stacking the upper center on top of that pelvis a little bit more, which is translating to a little bit more uh, of a curving left-hand path through impact. Um, when we see the rotation values, again, 91 degrees versus 89, the side bend amounts are almost identical. The forward bend amounts are almost identical. The pelvic numbers are within a degree. I mean, literally almost exactly the same backswing. The only difference being a little bit of the lift and sway values um, that are present. Now, very slightly larger, um, you know, we'll call it the Scott bad X factor between the two numbers there. Um, but the lead arm is a little bit more in on the draw swing. Uh, this is a planar player as well. A uh, little bit smaller X factor and lead arm a little bit more outward on top of the golf ball due to the structure, due to those tilts. Um, and then coming through the ball, you know, definitely we had a more leftward exit on the fade swing. We see that the chest rotation was a couple degrees more open at impact than the draw swing. So differential there. Um, only about four and five. So very similar values, but just a couple degrees more open um, there and a little bit less tilted. So the interesting thing was the chest uh, was definitely a little bit more forward on the fade swing at impact versus the, uh, versus the draw swing. So overall the player kind of moving uh, forward, let's say a little bit in front of it with the chest, if you will, and rotating, which has the effect of creating a more negative and more leftward swing direction. You know, we look at it from down the line here, we see, again, very, very similar views here, but we start to look at, this is the one I really like, because we see the effect that the biomechanics has on the overall shape of the hand path. And again, this is almost an identical swing, yet you change the structure and you change the hand path. So the fade swing on the right-hand side, you know, we see a little bit more leftward exit, we see a little bit lower finish, a little bit more rounded finish, uh, the one on the right, we see a little bit more tilt, a little bit straighter, if you will, uh, hand path through the golf ball, a little bit less curve in the hand path, um, which is going to promote perhaps a little bit more of a push draw. So, you know, a couple things I got from, from this player, and again, these were just two swings back to back. I mean, again, we could have taken hundreds of swings and, and cherry picked a few out of there, but this was literally just two swings back to back. One was a nice little push draw. One was a very, very slight pull fade. 
Uh, but this player is simply managing that draw and fade amount by changing the overall structure of their anatomy of the sway and lift amounts. By stacking the structure of the pelvis under the chest more um, at the top of the backswing, the effect is causing the hand path to shift outward slightly by P5 or halfway down. And that's going to allow the player to swing a little bit more leftward uh, than the draw swing. The finished tilts and rotations are simply different due to the above mentioned points. And again, if I'm comparing, you know, two swings of a player and I know that they're both fade swings uh, with a seven iron, perhaps at that point we can, we can make some, some correlations, but even better. So if we can put it on sports box and actually have the anatomical references to measure um, like Dr. Cheatham said, I think having that uh, at our fingertips is, is a huge, huge bonus. Um, that was kind of all, you know, in terms of just running through a couple of examples on how we can use that technology. Um, let me just unshare my screen here and we can maybe get to the questions here a little bit. No questions? You guys, I'm disappointed. Oh, there'll be questions. There's got to be questions. Yeah. yeah, come on. You're usually a lot more chatty, everyone is. It looks like Steve Moore is typing. Yeah, well, Steve Moore always types. He's, yeah. a, he's a good Irish lad. He's, he's, yes, uh, he is. He's in your area, right, Scott? He, uh, yeah, he did a little bit of work for me last year, actually. So he's, oh, cool. uh, he's a very, very good coach. Yeah, he's, uh, mm -hmm. he's definitely an up-and-coming uh, Canadian coach, for sure. Cool, yeah. We know Steve at Sports Box. Yeah, he'll he'll have lots of questions for. You. Now, what was the, okay? Uh, so Steve Steve is asking if there's any difference in setup between shots. Uh, what I saw by the numbers was because I tried to pair the video up as closely as possible. It was a little difficult to get the setups exact, right? Because the timings were going to be a little bit different with the, let's say, the positioning throughout. So. Basically, I looked at impact and brought the swing backwards to try and get, you know, similar P5 values, similar top of the back swing values, et cetera. So by the time I get all the way back to setup, the setups were very, very slightly different. Um, I would say, you know, handle slightly closer for the fade, slightly further for the draw. Um, you know, just that was a visual um, sort of uh, conclusion that, that, that came from that. And then secondly, um, you know, perhaps... Yeah, a little bit more open with the pelvis and the shoulders that set up for the fade, you know, perhaps a little bit, but I, it wasn't large enough to be a discernible difference. Really. It was, it was more just hit the draw, hit the fade. Let's see what the differences are through the movement. I, I have a question, Steph. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yep. Can, can somebody sort of explain the hand, uh, the sway and the lift, like how, like how that's measured and, and from what point to what point, like if it's seven inches or whatever, it, you know, what is that measuring exactly? Yeah, I can certainly answer that. It's measured, sway of the hand is measured pretty much the same way as sway of the, of the body or the pelvis or the chest. Sway is just left to right motion. So at address, we set it to zero. And so it's the difference in motion from the address position to the furthest it goes to the trail side, to the furthest it goes to the lead side. And then lift is the same. You set it to zero at address, and it's how much the hand goes up and goes down. And it's a point between both hands on the shaft of the club. Perfect, thank you. Anyone else? Wow, got a quiet group tonight. <laughs> everyone's everyone's out teaching right now. It's it's a nice day in Canada. You know, I'm surprised Steve's actually uh, you know at home uh, watching this. He should be uh, go making a pile of money teaching tonight. Yeah, the weather spring has finally hit Toronto. Yes, yeah, it was very nice today. It was almost eighty today. Too good nice, to miss. Very nice. Well. Is any well? I don't know if anyone on this call is in the Dallas area and uh, planning to come to the Byron Nelson, but Sportsbox is here. Um, we are doing an activation with AT and T. 
um, to demonstrate their 5G speeds with the cloud and the pipeline and how fast it is to transfer from device to device. So we have a little setup, you know, with a launch or not launch, yeah, with foresight setup, launch monitor, um, and we're doing little swing analyses and lessons. It's been very fun. We had a busy first day and then I ran back to the Airbnb to jump on here and see you guys. Um, but you know, if anyone's around, please stop by and say hi. Um, I'm gonna do one more last call for questions, but I guess everyone is feeling a little shy tonight. Uh, my guys uh, aren't. My uh, guys I have aren't. a question for the doc for the doctor. Mm -hmm. So you have there's so many parameters that you can put on the screen. You get out on the range with with a student, it's almost too many numbers to look at. If you had just you wanted to focus on just a few initially, what would those be? I mean, obviously you've shown the two parameters that are 100%, the two parameters are 95%. Is that what you should work on initially with a student or, or are there a certain parameters? It's almost too many to put all of these different things on. They never match up to the pro numbers, even with the deviations. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And, and we're trying to, give you different numbers so you can make the choice. And, and that's pretty hard to do sometimes. But bottom line is if, if you're teaching something specific and you want your golfer to do what you're trying to tell them, then you have to kind of put your mind in, uh, what am I gonna look at? What is gonna show me that? Just like Sean, uh, sorry, just like what Scott did um, when he was looking at uh, the different lies and the different types of shots. Basically, I'm saying that you kind of cherry pick from the numbers that we've got because you have a lot of choice. So basically the core numbers that we have at the moment are the sway and the lift and the turn and the side bend numbers. So you can look at those. I mean, obviously if you're working with a novice player and maybe Scott can address this better than me, I think because he's an instructor, I'm not an instructor, I'm a scientist. But, you know, you could look at are they getting the right shoulder turn, uh, chest turn, are they getting the right pelvis turn, are they, you know, reverse pivoting, so they got too much sway in the backswing, are they hanging back, they got not enough sway in the downswing, just your typical basic faults, turn them into numbers. And we're trying to do that. We're, we're trying to give you examples of faults in the swing or issues in the swing and how to measure them. I think that's something that's uh, that's in our level one certification. So if you were to do a level one certification, we tell you, okay, here's some common faults and these are the parameters, these are the trackers that you need to look at uh, in order to assess those. I don't know, Connor, is that uh, help? Um, sorry, uh, we also have Ryan Crawley, our director of sales, who's a coach um, on the call. And Ryan has been giving a bunch of mini lessons with Sports Box to Golf today. So. Maybe Ryan, Ryan has some insights and as well as Scott. Yeah, absolutely. So I think Phil like kind of hit it on the head, but as a coach, you've taught lots and lots of lessons. So when you watch somebody swing, you kind of understand, Hey, what kind of fault do they have? Is this somebody that's swaying on the way back? Is this somebody that's not rotating enough? And then from there, it's just selecting the trackers that are going to support whatever you want to talk about. So you can keep it as simple as you want. I just did, you know, I think in total, we did right around 130 lessons today um, using 3D analysis, right? And all we do is we look at somebody's swing, we select a couple of little trackers and we're able to then show them exactly what's going on. And then they can see if they've actually made the change or not, where I think that this has a ton of value there, being able to actually track progress is your player making the change when they feel like they're making the movement pattern or are they not? So keep it very, very simple. You know, really uh, the level one certification is great for this, I would say as well, because we do kind of highlight some key little um, faults that you can just start looking at and understanding the different patterns within 3D. Um, but yeah, I would say the number one mistake that I see with coaches is we're just turn on all of the trackers and then it becomes informa information overload for you, your player. And now you're looking at the screen like, well, what's good, what's bad? You know, if you keep it really, really simple, 
you're going to really enjoy how this can impact your, your lessons and how it really helps your students get better faster. Yeah, I think on that note, too, just as a, a quick aside, I, I think uh, two points, uh, like Ryan said, uh, you know, one of the things I think in this day and age, we have so much great information about golf swings, you know, from multiple sources all over the world, you know, lots of great researchers, lots of, uh, you know, great information, but it's up to us as coaches to be able to prioritize that and, and having that ability to, to do what Ryan said and put up the trackers that makes sense for the player in front of you is, is probably the best way to use that, uh, to use sports box. Um, from the research standpoint, obviously like a guy like Phil who's, who's looking at everything to a certain extent, you know, putting all those numbers, all those trackers, he wants to know what everything's doing um, just to catalog that in his database. But from a teaching perspective, I think it's, it's like a magician. You only want to show them what, what needs to be shown. You know, the other stuff that's going on behind the scenes, we don't need to show them that. And I, I think that's a good value with that. The other point I think um, with the teaching perspective is, is in, you know, my estimation, most of our players that we work with who are, you know, middle or, or higher level handicap players, um, going back to what Phil said, I thought was really great in his presentation about the 35 degrees of freedom at each joint, you know, that we have between the ground basically and the golf club. And for the most part, with most of our players, we're trying to contain those degrees of freedom somewhat. We're trying to build some sort of a consistency pattern, if you will, on those 35 different degrees of freedom. Um, interestingly enough, by the time you get to a high level player who is a, a plus handicap and a tour player, you're actually opening up degrees of freedom again, because you want them to be able to hit different shots. You want them to be able to hit draws and fades and all the other things. So you're going from removing degrees of freedom to a large extent with the majority of our golfers to actually reintroducing some degrees of freedom to have more adaptability, um, as our, as our players become, become more high level. So very, very interesting. And, and certainly something I'll be thinking about a little bit is, is more about some of those other degrees of freedom that, uh, that we can play with. Well said. Mm -hmm. um, we have a message, uh, a direct message from Craig Foster um, in the chat. It says, uh, can Sportsbox AI measure rotation in the forearm and wrist, wrist, sorry, excuse me, wrist degrees of freedom? Not at this point, no. We hope to in the future, but you can imagine that's going to be very difficult wow. because you have to have a really good uh, view of the hands and the wrists. We're using video and we're using AI. So I think we can, but uh, that's something a little bit further ahead in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, it all depends too, like obviously from the technology, which is amazing to be able to build the, the skeletal framework, if you will, to be able to, to, to look at those things must be, you know, must be absolutely astronomical in terms of, of, of what you need to do to build this sort of 3D representation of a joint. Yeah, and we're literally only just getting started. I mean, we've only been, we're, we're the new kid on the block. So we're learning as we go and, and we see great things ahead because AI is extremely powerful. And I think we're just scratching the surface. I like to think of it as the magic camera. I've been in motion capture for of the golf swing for a long time, more than I care to think. Um, and I've always dreamed of being able to get a golf swing without having to put all the wires and sensors that AMM used or markers or everything. So we're finally there. And that's very exciting to me. And it's only going to get better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, this has come up a few times this week that we're a very young company. I mean, we're less than a, a year and a half old. And I feel like we've obviously I'm biased, but I think it's safe to say that we have achieved a lot in, it, in this Absolutely. short period of time. So just imagine what the future holds, right? Just, just give us a little bit more time and, you know, we'll get there. <laughs> okay, well, it's right on the hour and I'm going to say that we're going to be able to end on time. <laughs> thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Scott. Um, and we will see you guys next time. Bye. Sounds good, guys. Thanks for attending. Yeah, thank you guys. Bye. Have a good night.